Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Freedom Doc webinar. Uh, today, we will get started here in about three minutes. Um, give everybody a chance to get on their lunch break and get joined in here with us. And while you are waiting, why don't you hit up that chat box and let us know what state you're tuning in from. We, Dana and I actually are together today, which is kind of fun <laughs> for a, a webinar to get to be a, in the same area, but we're coming here from Indianapolis with a little bit of sunshine for once. How about it? <laughs> <laughs> for now, anyway. The, the, the last month has not been so, but how about <laughs> it? <laughs> An hour here and there, so uh, we're looking forward to the, the weekend. I'm sure there'll be baseball in both of our weekends. <laughs> Jason, <laughs> we Jason kids. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's see here. Chat box going. Grab yourself a cup of coffee, refill, a cup of water. And we'll hit the ground running here right at right at 12.03 on the dot. You've got one minute. All right. Going to go ahead and hop in. Welcome for those of you just joining us. I want to give you a, a couple of housekeeping things real quickly before I introduce our guest of honor today. And we will, you'll see a poll pop up here in uh, just a few minutes. If you can take the time to just click on that um, poll, answer through those questions, give us an idea of who we're talking to today. That's one nice thing with the webinar is we have the, the chat and poll and uh, QA enabled so we can. Learn a little bit about you, even though we can't see your faces. Um, the q and if you have any questions that you want Dane or I to answer during our conversation today, feel free to, to put those there and we will get to them um, towards the end of our conversation. And as far as the chat goes, it is open. Um, we are both very conversational people, as you'll see going throughout this and, and social and would love um, your interaction with us as well. So um, feel free to chat there. Okay, let me go ahead and stop our share here so we can hop in. So I'm Sarah Harker, I'll be your host today. I'm the Business Development Manager at Freedom. And uh, just to give you a little bit of background on myself, I am actually a nurse and I left the floor about six years ago now, which is kind of hard to believe, uh, to start help uh, alleviating the burnout in the healthcare system. A little bit after I um, went on, on my way with that, I was introduced to Freedom HealthWorks and um, came over to see what was going on here and drink the juice very quickly. And now <laughs> um, they're gonna have trouble getting rid of me here. But um, one thing that I really loved about this job is getting the chance to not only help reduce burnout, but completely remove those barriers that are often the cause of it. So we'll talk more about that um, later on today. And then Dane Delosier is joining us today. He is our COO at Freedom Health Works and um, man of many hats. He has many talents that you'll hear about as we're going out through the day. Um, number one is business. So, uh, Dean, why don't why don't we kick things off by you telling us a little bit about what brought you to business to begin with, and uh, over to Freedom. Wow, what brought me to business? So many people don't know that I started out my journey in occupational therapy. Yeah. Not totally professionally, but uh, in school, I was in school for occupational therapy. And uh, like many 19 year olds, didn't have any clue what I wanted to do. <laughs> and therefore, um, ended up sort of picking a business degree um, just to, I guess, have the license to go explore. And it's a pretty good generalized degree. Mm -hmm. And it was probably a good thing for me at that time. Anyways, um, 
I sort of got an elbow into the business world um, following that and um, started to recognize that that journey sort of took me in certain directions. And I just sort of followed what I liked and what I didn't like. And um, it ended up um, uh, sort of putting me into an entrepreneurial realm pretty early in life. I was in my mid-20s and um, started my own first business, um, repping manufacturers at the time. Um, and that led to um, some opportunities that opened up. And I, I was just pretty generally open to things and, and uh, just simply said yes. Um, fast forward all the way through um, pretty much of a career. What brought me to Indianapolis was uh, an ultrasound company and helping it get an exit um, in um, uh, the sale of this business. Um, that went pretty well and uh, um, ended up uh, with the business for a while, um, but hating every minute working for a large <laughs> British aerospace company. So I, I paused there a moment just because some of the images were jumping into my head as I was like, oh gosh, I hated those days. <laughs> but um, anyways, um, a friend of mine gave me an elbow at that time and she said, hey, look, you've been doing strategy and execution now for a long time. And um, why don't you go out and start teaching it and sharing what you've learned? And so in 2015, I announced to this British company that uh, had purchased our business um, that I wasn't going to stick around. And uh, but I'd be happy to, happy to help throughout the rest of the year. And anyways, um, had an opportunity to name my successor and kind of a neat experience in that. Right. But um, went out and started doing this. And that was about the time that I met uh, Chris and Adam Habig, the founders of Freedom HealthWorks. And um, my involvement wasn't much um, until more recently. Um, it was much more in an advisory capacity. There was even an advisory board we had um, helping the business. But um, COVID was really the beginning of um, uh, the uh, movement um, in a more accelerated way. I think everybody who might be even here today might have recognized that in their own way. Um, whatever it was, either people questioning you know, I don't want to do this the way I'm being asked to do it, um, or I'm not happy doing what I'm doing. I've got to find something else. Um, it definitely kicked everything into gear. And that's the point where Chris and I started talking about a little more involvement and helping operationally. So that's kind of how I got to Freedom HealthWorks. Um, one of the interesting things, um, maybe just sort of as an adjacent point, is uh, I've been around medicine all my life. My dad was a small town family physician. Um, I'm married to a physician. Um, my wife's father was a physician. There are many medical professionals in my family, um, an uncle, an ear, nose, and throat surgeon. Um, anyway, uh, we've all, a lot of people in my life that have um, influenced some of my outlook and um, much like my teammates here at Freedom HealthWorks, um, really enjoy a very committed effort to making healthcare better, right? We all come at it from a, from a place of experience and it was pretty important to us that we do something to impact some of the problems we see in healthcare. Yeah, awesome. That's um, a great segue into all the uh, great questions that you guys have submitted today. Um, you'll hear a little bit more about kind of what led both of us to freedom as we go throughout here, but um, we have a lot on the agenda. I just wanna briefly say, um, continue putting those questions in the Q&A. Uh, if you have any that you'd like answered live, uh, we will have this recorded for those of you who want to share this with your friends. Um, and that will be going out after. Feel free to, to share that or reply to that email with any other further questions you have. And we'll make sure we get those answered. And um, what we're kicking off with right now is going to be the most common questions that we get for people looking at um, starting a DPC and sometimes even from people in the middle of it. <laughs> um, so we will... Um, start off with who should consider this. Now we get a lot of questions about, am, am I right for this job? Or do I have the personality? You know, my, my favorite that I hear from almost everyone is I had one credit hour of business <laughs> class in med school 20 years ago. <laughs> um, I don't know that, that I can do this. Uh, so Dane, how would you respond to that one? Well, I'll, I'll start with one point. This is not like Wall Street and um, even necessarily needing an MBA to go do this business. Um, the journey that we're all on is not something new. Um, physicians have been around and medicine has been around a long time. And the practice of this relationship 
is um, pretty proven out. I like to call it or say that we're not really making a market. Mm -hmm. So um, when I think of entrepreneurship in medicine, um, you know, to me, we're not really making this market. Really, anybody who's in front of me is a potential patient. If I'm a physician or a nurse practitioner or whatever it is that you might be doing, um, and um, I just need to make it you aware that I'm available, right? If if um, we think this relationship can be productive, and so um, I I will probably reference that metaphor again um, as we talk, but. Um, entrepreneurship to me is like a continuum. And um, so on the, each end of that continuum, um, in between those two points, there's give me total freedom and I want to find my own way. And there's give me a job, right? I want security and I want the ability to earn a living and I want to go home and forget about it and relax for the day. And um, I think what we're seeing is, is that there's quite a mix of people in that continuum. Um, I probably would say also, Sarah always laughs at me when I do this, but um, in that center of the, the bell curve, if you will, 70% of the market, right, probably may not even take the step in this direction. But there's a percentage of those folks out there that are recognizing that they can deliver care a better way than what's being done today. And they want to know there's a path. And so um, is it right for you? Only you can can know that. Um, there are probably some key attributes mm -hmm. that I would point to, though. Um, I think it takes a certain amount of resilience. Um, you know, things are going to happen. Um, realizing, you know, there's an ideal, there's a DPC practice ideal. It isn't going to happen exactly how you expect. But um, if you can be pragmatic um, about that and be resilient when things do come up, um, it still is a pretty proven model. Again, many, many folks have been before us in a direct patient and doctor relationship. This is not something that um, is new to humanity. <laughs> so um, you have to have a certain propensity for risk. Um, and it's not what you think in terms of um, classic entrepreneurial risk, mm -hmm. but rather um, a willingness to put yourself out there. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, that's something that um, is really important. If you're not comfortable doing so, that's something that you would want to really evaluate. Vision. Um, again, I would, I would use this term vision, which you hear all the time in, um, in business and or in, you know, you know, in a um, corporate environment. However, you have a vision of the way you want to practice care or can deliver care, strong sense of purpose. And I think that if you're comfortable ex exercising that or articulating that, um, then this is okay. This is a place you can come and be comfortable. Yeah. Adaptability, right? Again, every, every environment has unique circumstances and you're gonna have to adapt geographically. You're gonna have to adapt, adapt, um, Oh, I don't know. Um, you know, to the people you're serving and the people that show up, um, you want to align those um, your value proposition to who is showing up. And then, of course, you got to be self motivated. You got to get out of bed every day, and you got to get up, and you got to go do it. We all do it. And you're just now doing it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the road, or the excuse me, the the buck stops with you, and um, that takes a certain amount of responsibility to. But um, staying motivated and focused, um, uh, having a strong work ethic is really um, helpful. And then finally, probably of things I think about um, in this common question, really are empathy. You know, good entrepreneurs and doctors are often skilled um, at understanding the needs and desires of their patients. They see it every day. Empathy allows them to connect to the value proposition that they can deliver. So mm -hmm. when you feel that and you see that of the person that's across the table from you or in the exam room with you, um, it's giving you information of what way you can serve that need. And so I guess maybe those are some of the characteristics that we run into most and that would really make folks successful in this environment. Yeah, that, I think that's a, a great list of them. Um, 
I think another question that we often hear kind of grouped in with that is, uh, is regarding their competition. I think you kind of, um, one thing you didn't mention is kind of collaboration. I mm -hmm. think you were kind of getting there with the, yeah. um, you know, in, in the DPC world, we see a lot of collaboration rather than traditional medicine where it's a lot of focus on competition. So typically when people are kind of coming to us at the, at the beginning of their research phase through this, they're wondering, well, you know, there's three other DPCs in my area. Mm -hmm. Should I be concerned with those competitors? Will, I, will that affect me making it? Yeah, certainly. Um, I think in this realm, um, so first of all, Sarah said something key, right? And I think this is pretty common wisdom among DPC mm -hmm. communities that about 500 patients make a panel, right? Or a full panel, five or 600 patients or something. Depends on how driving you want to be. Mm -hmm. um, that's not a very large percentage of the market. Even in a small town, it's still not a very large percentage of the market. Um, you know, you can take a town like Zionsville, Indiana, um, I think it's something like 30 or 35,000 people in Zionsville proper. Well, 500 patients isn't even a percent. So it's it's just, you know, it's in terms of another DPC being present, um, it's not something you need to be worried about. In fact, I would say it's helping you make awareness. Um, you know, the whole mall idea that if you put all the stores together, people will come there commonly and it draws the crowd. Well, I think it, it, it create in this case, it creates the awareness. Um, and so that's um, really important. I would add though, um, when you think about competition, um, you really want to identify um, what are the competitive things for the, uh, um, that individual's attention around healthcare or even their budget. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of folks will ask us, you know, well, gosh, how will people really pay $100 a month? It is very quick to recognize um, that um, if you buy a Starbucks once a day, you know, even just during the weekdays, not during the weekends, mm -hmm. and you spent five bucks, you would be there in no time. So it's, it's, it's a choice that people make around their own spending priorities. Mm -hmm. Um, and competitively, you're competing against other choices that they would make. Um, so, uh, you know, those are the kinds of things you want to be mindful of, or, or maybe it's the gym, or maybe it's the whatever, but um, people prioritize, it could be streaming services. Some people have, you know, subscriptions to six different services. And if they just said, you know, I'll take a break on a couple of those, they would be in good shape and, and yeah. um, be able to afford or prioritize this. Well, whenever it matters, it matters and they come motivated and they will prioritize. And we can see that even in terms of um, age groups and the people that show up in the communities. Yeah, I, you know, I like to say that your competitor isn't the DPC across the street. That's your, you know, that's your buddy. That's the person that you're and helping move this movement for your competitors, Orange Theory, or a massage company with memberships, or um, Dane was teasing me earlier because I said Gucci. <laughs> so it's really those, you know, priorities about around where people are spending. And when you get people who are focused on their health and um, improving that, or even just improving access to health, that's where you're looking is someone who's willing to spend, you know, $150 on a monthly membership for something else health-related those are going to be those people. Right. Yeah. I also, um, uh, actually, let's go on to that. I, if there's any other questions that show up on that, please bring them up. Um, sure. We hear all kinds of things from that that topic. Okay. Yeah, I do see another question in here, and don't worry, we'll get to it. You're, you're right on topic. Um, <laughs> but just to kind of piggyback on um, who should consider this, the next question that we always get is around financing. Once they've decided I think I could do this. I think I'm that kind of person. I'm I'm dedicated. I can get out of bed and make things happen and uh, keep you know swinging with the punches, so to speak. Uh, but what about finances? Um, what's this going to cost to start up? What's this? Um, how long is it going to take for me to see that return on the investment or to be able to pay myself? So uh, let's move that way around around finances a little bit, Dean. Um, okay. So what's your advice as far as how to finance the startup and and where to even start with that? Well. First of all, um, it's really smart to plan a little bit. Um, and I call this a business case, but you want to get an idea of what are your costs, what are the expenses you're going to have until you get the revenue coming in, 
and do a calculation of how much working capital you need. And I call that a business case. Well, a business case isn't just finance. There's other returns than just money. Um, you know, there's balance of life, there's quality of life, there's, you know, many ways you can define or, you know, put those factors into a business case. But um, that business case has to make sense and it's got to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. One of the things, too, that you achieve when you kind of lay that out on a piece of paper or on a spreadsheet or something is you get the ability to do what I call sensitivities analysis. You can you can look at, hey, the upside, which is easy for everybody to look at, but we always flip the narrative and ask what's the downside so that we can be prepared um, for um, if it doesn't go right or the way we thought. Um, there was an acronym. I wish I could give it credit to who it's due. Um, I can't think of who originated it, but there's a an acronym, W-R-A-P, RAP. You wrap tough decisions or big decisions that you have in life. And it's simply widen your perspective, research your options, achieve distance, and then, of course, the last one is prepare to be wrong so that you know you can tolerate um, a recovery if you've got to or you've got a um, I call it a safety or an off ramp that you can take um, to get you back to where you need to be. Um, so back to finances, um, there's lots of ways to do it. Um, so the uh, probably the most common way is you pay take money from your savings um, and uh, put that money to work. Uh, it's got a fantastic ROI. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But um, you're, you know, what we're seeing, um, even in our own environment, where uh, even someone would buy a Freedom Health Works services, uh, the working capital needs, um, you know, just for the business itself, um, run anywhere from forty to sixty thousand dollars. That includes um, paying us. That's everything else that you have in a startup expense. Um, and that also is all you really need to uh, to the point where you've started to produce profit. You're pulling your money back off the table and now you're off and running. Mm. So I use that as a cost basis. And when I talk about um, the finances, that isn't necessarily all you need, though. And so you have to determine what specifically you need beyond that to make as a living. Plenty of entrepreneurs um, recognize that they're going to not make in, in any income for six to 12 months. Um, if, if, if I go more ubiquitously to entrepreneurship and just business in general worldwide, right, all industries, most businesses um, don't really produce a profit for three to five years. And um, boy, the... Uh, the failure rate is high because many times they're inventing an idea or a product or something. Again, remember what I said earlier, this is not inventing anything. This is a relationship that's been around a long time. So um, what we see is, is when that, if, if $60,000 is your investment um, and you're able to pull that money back off the table in 18 months, and now everything that's being returned on that original $60,000 investment over a three or four or 10 or 20 year period, what we're seeing is, is in three or four years, um, you're, you're, you know, multiplying that $60,000 by, you know, five or six times. Mm. So it's a really strong business case to get back to that. And so um, individuals can make that choice and they can pull from their savings. Uh Many times people pull from their home equity. One interesting thing about home equity loans is, is that frequently you can um, uh, get back the interest. It's deductible on your taxes. So that can be like free money. Um, you can partner up with other DPCs. Um, we at Freedom Health Works have also done something um, where we've, um, we're not doing it quite as much traditionally the way we had um, where we'll hold a note on the services that we provide, that's a piece of it. Remember, there's the whole working capital needs, um, but that's a piece of it. And um, we would hold a note and take a payment. Um, but knowing that this is a normal challenge for people, we put together um, a fund that is a, makes the resources available to the physician or to the to the customer, the client to cover all those startup expenses, to cover the ability to pay themselves some money so they can sustain their at-home bills, 
um, all the upfront marketing and expenses that are necessary to open that practice and um, fill that practice. So then, um, so if you want to learn more about that, Sarah is your person. She can talk to you about that. Uh, that's not what we're here for today. But um, there are other sources like that out there. Um, you can take on a financial partner and you can form a partnership in it. Um, so many ways in which we can find the need, needed working capital. Probably the most important thing I would say, though, is, is be very mindful of the business case. Yep, it's easy to get to the optimistic view. Take a look at the pessimistic view and make sure that you can tolerate the downside before you leap into this. Yeah, I think, you know, Dane mentioned it. I'm more than happy to have a conversation with you around that. That's something that we love to do is look at those um, projections for your area and um, play with our numbers a little bit. That's what I like to say to see a pessimistic view and an optimistic view to give you an idea, a really realistic idea of what, what you're getting into. And if that falls, if that sounds interesting to you or like something you're, you would want more information on, you can feel free to just throw your email down in that chat and you can make it so it goes directly to me. So everyone doesn't have your email if you'd like. Um, and I'll be happy to reach out to you and, and go through those numbers personally with you. Um, thank you for filling that in. That was a, that was a mouthful. It's a lot of options. <laughs> yeah, there are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, don't hesitate to reach out and ask questions. I think that's one area where people get pretty intimidated by, by uh, what to do next. Yeah. And I will say to the community at large that um, the team hears me say this frequently, but anybody who's in DPC, and helping this movement is a friend. Mm -hmm. So we make space, our whole team does make space for those kinds of conversations. Um, we're very sharing about our understanding. Um, we've launched now quite a few practices. Um, I'm pretty certain we've blown through a hundred now. Um, and, um, you know, when you've journeyed that much, you, you pick up a lot of insight, um, which can be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go from there. We were talking pessimistic, optimistic view. Let's <laughs> let's talk about those options. Should we start with uh, the good or the bad? Oh, <laughs> you, the you pick it. <laughs> Lead me where you want to go. Let's let's start with uh, what could go wrong. What could go wrong? That. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So <laughs> the. <laughs> the um, generally, it's not about making the market that I I'm concerned about, right? And I've said that a few times. Where I see it get challenged among folks in this space is where they have distractions. Um, I've done a lot of um, executive coaching and senior leadership um, coaching in my journey. And uh, it happens in all businesses, by the way. It is not uncommon. Um, we talk about the vital few things and focus on the vital few things and the necessary need to dial down the distractions. Um, one big one is if we're struggling because we need to work a job versus launch a practice. Now people can do it and they do do it very successfully, um, but it is hard work. So the more you can kind of set the stage for success on the front end, the better. And the more you can focus solitarily on your agenda, or your objective of getting that practice up and running, the better, right? So that's a that's a huge one. Probably that's not the number one challenge though. The, the, the number one challenge that I think we see most mm -hmm. is not putting yourself out there, right? Um, so you went to medicine to study a lot of information, master a lot of information diagnostically and to help people but it's not natural for you to just go out and be the public face of your business. So if you're sitting um, contemplating this and that's really uncomfortable for you, I don't wanna mince my words. I wouldn't necessarily encourage it. What I would say though is, is you do not need to be Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan Chase <laughs> to start a business like this. You just have to be comfortable communicating clearly with people and putting yourself out there in your community. That's, that's what my dad did. Yep, it was a small town, right? We got our first street light when I was a senior in high school, rural town, central Pennsylvania. And um, anyway, uh, being comfortable putting yourself out there is a uh, really important matter. Yeah, um, I think that's our number one is it's uh, uh, you're, when you're starting a small business, you can't be afraid of talking about it. 
Uh, they're not, it's a, not a, if you build it, they will come kind of scenario. You have to talk about them, talk about what you're offering for them to come. Um, and I, I think that's a, a big place that we kind of see, see uh, people struggle a little bit. Um, if there's a struggle, that's where it's coming from on, on my end of what I've seen. So um, that being said, that doesn't mean if you're not an extroverted person that you have to suddenly become this you know, bubbly uh, talk show host type of personality. It's, we want you to be you. Uh, there is, um, you know, the, the piece about DPC that I really love is that if you've seen one DPC, you've seen one DPC. You'll hear that a lot around here. They're all different. And that's what we want. We want you to bring what you uniquely have to offer this world and, and your patients. So um, we don't want you to turn into, uh, you know, someone else, but we will say, you know, you're going to have to get out of your comfort zone a little bit if you are introverted. Um, I spoke with one uh, doctor a few weeks ago, Dane, that was, um, he, he would identify himself as more introverted than extroverted, I think. And uh, his practice is really focused on preventative health. Uh, he's a runner himself, but we talked about him going to just a local business that uh, sells running shoes. They have a, a running club every week. And he wears his T-shirt that has his logo from his practice when he goes to run. And he's not going out to, you know, kind of make sales and be in a salesy way. He's just out developing genuine relationships with people and not hiding what he's there doing. So, you know, it's going to be very natural when you're networking for someone to ask you about what's on your shirt if they're meeting you or what do you do? And not just saying, oh, I'm a doctor, but really letting them know what you're working on and how you're trying to move this market to a safer place for patients and, and physicians as well. I call it an awareness campaign, right? Really it's, it, it, it really is conversational and it's just, you know, it, I remember five years ago, it was, it was difficult explaining the idea of DPC because no one knew what it was. Today, we kind of surpassed that. People, mm -hmm. they at least have an idea. Hey, wait a minute. I know I've heard about that, <laughs> right? Um, so now it's just, hey, you know, it's this innovative primary care model that makes, um, you know, that kind of cuts all that noise out of the relationship and lets us work together yeah. and uh, get to a productive place much, much more quickly. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think, um, you know, finding your people is a good help to getting, <laughs> right. getting clear on who it is you're trying to serve. You know, a lot of times people will get into business for the first time and they think, oh, I've got to serve everybody. And they're kind of scrambling, figuring out how they can serve everybody rather than focusing on, on uh, really their ideal patient, what they love doing. Uh, we've seen time and time again, the, the more niche the practice is, the better that they start off doing is they're very clear on who they're talking to. So um, keep that in mind as well. You have anything else you want to add to what can go wrong or can we move on to the positive <laughs> fun stuff? <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there's lots of things that could, right? But I, they're mostly tactical. I guess that's maybe one thing I don't want to leave this topic on without having shared. Like in your office environment, um, as you're set up, right? If you've got, if you've invested in all these tools in your office, right? The integrations, our friends out there in the industry are very good at articulating how to get in, things integrating. And, um, uh, you know, so the point is, we want you focusing on your best and highest calling, which is care itself. And, uh, you know, and when we think about our own value proposition, we want to enable you in every way we possibly can. Mm -hmm. So the key is take advantage of those systems integrations. Make sure systems are talking to one another so you don't have to key things three times, right? Or copy and paste a million times. Um, the system missed opportunity. If you can automate something or delegate it, delegate it. And if it's not your best and highest calling, delegate it, please. Um, it lets you stay focused on the important stuff in your business as, as the operating CEO, if you will. The other thing that I want to share before we depart from this subject is um, something that we see also is, is it a disconnect between sort of the sales effort and the marketing effort? In fact, I'd flip those marketing and sales to put them in order. So marketing is out there working hard to connect you, whatever marketing you're using, whether you're doing your own, whether you're using an outside supplier or, or provider um, working with us is if those two things are disconnected and they're not communicating or talking to each other about um, who's coming in the door, is it the right person showing up? In other words, is marketing delivering the leads that are the right people that align with my value proposition as a doctor um, or a DPC owner um, and um, getting that feedback quickly um, so that adjustments can be made. Marketing always laugh about it. Someone said marketing's half, just half not worth it. Well, you just don't know which half it is. And um, 
the truth is in this business, uh, what we've learned is marketing really does work. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the point is, is that there's almost a very, I don't know in any other industry I've been, been involved, a direct correlation between investment and getting a return on that investment by people becoming members. Um, we see it in freedom. We see it in clients' practices. We see it in friends of the business's practices. So um, really um, uh, an important thing and making sure that those two things are working in concert and that they're communicating, those two functions are communicating with each other so that they're not just um, operating in a vacuum. Now let's get on to the fun stuff. Yeah, I, I saw a really, fun stuff. I saw a really interesting question about expansion. So yeah, uh, that's great. We're getting we're getting close to the <laughs> So So uh, let's talk about what can go right. Um, you know, my I, there's a lot of things there. Like I get a little overexcited about this part. <laughs> um, but my favorite part of our of my job is getting to talk to people after they've opened. And to see the light coming back to their eyes again of like they're a real person, not a zombie that's just going from box to box, checking off of things to, um, you know, kind of avoid the smack on their hand from admin or, or insurance either way. So um, I, I love that part. And I love hearing about the big life change that they experience. So um, when I like to uh, compare it with, you know, traditional medicine, you're doing everything even from med school on to fit your life around your, your job. So, you know, your holidays are planned around that. You're skipping kids events because you're on call, you know, or you're on the phone while you're at them, all those sorts of things. Um, whereas with, when you're opening a direct care practice, you, you don't have those types of commitments. You're able to actually build um, your practice around your life. And that is, that is the priority. So, um, We've got all sorts of great quotes from uh, different clients that we've heard uh, come through. Dane and I like to talk about one that said they're just so happy that they get to have uh, coffee with their wife again or lunch with their wife again. Um, another fun one is that uh, Dr. McDonald, who's been on a webinar in the past, if you've been attending our, you heard him say, um, he called me one day and said, Sarah, did you know it's light outside at 1030 a.m.? <laughs> Um, because he was so used to going to work when it was dark and getting home when it was dark. And uh, so there's there's uh, so many great quotes from that. Anything that comes to mind for you? Just what's life like after yeah. after <laughs> you yeah. make this leap? Um, yeah. After you get over all, all, all the fear and, and you start to get some progress and some success achieved, it's uh, there's just it's life is real again. I mean, it's human again. Um but uh, uh, not to mention your income is going to be better. Um, I don't, you know, the the uh, what the average hospital pays for a, a hospital loan practice is one thing. And um, when you own your own business and there's no, you know, third party administrator in the middle of your relationship with your patient, um, it leaves a fair amount of value um, to be captured. And, um, you know, that isn't what it's all about, of course. Um, at the end, in fact, most of you didn't come to this for that. Mm -hmm. um, there are entrepreneurs here, though, and um, uh, we see all types coming to this. Um, we as humans are complex, right? And it, there's nothing wrong with putting together a, a practice of 20 locations someday. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some real um, strong elements to that business case. Um, but yeah, life, um, your income, your free time to practice, you know, or to do what you want, you know, just leisurely, but also um, your ability to deliver care the way you want. Nobody's looking over your shoulder and saying, we want more flu shots. We want more mammograms. We want more colonoscopies, right? Um, you can recommend those things, but you all well know, particularly you well-practiced um, providers, um, know that what's sitting on the other side of the table or in the exam room with you is only going to do what they're going to do. They'll either listen to you or they won't. You don't really have control over making that individual do it, yet your hospital is pounding on you to improve those metrics. Mm -hmm. It is completely wrong. It's it's just got to go. <laughs> but yeah. um, anyways, I could get off on a tangent with that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think um, as far as what can go right, another thing that we often hear is, no more paperwork, or at least it seems like there's none compared to what, what you're coming from. Um, that as well as the patient relationship, which you touched on being there. Of, um, you know, when I'm talking to people who are just entering in this idea, um, they're telling me how they're seeing 30 to 35 patients a day in 15 minute increments. 
how do you get to know your patients or what's even going on with them with, with that? Um, and I've never met one yet who says they like it that way, <laughs> or they feel like they're able to deliver good care, or they're um, you know, able to really live out the calling that they felt on their life to come to medicine and that type of a situation. So um, when your DPC is open, for those of you who haven't, haven't opened yet, what you're going to typically see on average is seeing about eight patients a day in person, and those average around 60 minutes a visit, usually about 90 when it's a, the first patient visit, because you're able to actually sit and and take your time and get to the root of what are what is causing some of those issues rather than just um, checking the boxes and trying to do the best that you can on uh, right. as you're walking backwards out of the door. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I um, think that I don't think we have any questions around there about anybody else have any other questions about lifestyle or things that are going could go right or go wrong. Feel free to um, throw those in there. Um. I think that we have summed up just about everything as far as lifestyle goes and um, and finances for now. I think we're ready to move on to seeing how um, how your practice is developing and um, when to start hiring people. And we're getting down to this this question here for expansion next. Uh, so why don't we switch gears just a little bit and uh, talk a little bit about after your your practice is open, it's going great. Um, you're, you're on, in it on your own, typically, and most of our docs are starting and, and nurse practitioners are starting to practice on their own without an MA in person or um, anything like that yet. When do they know that it's time to hire Dean, whether that's an MA or a, it, another doc? Yeah, initially. So we typically counsel about year two. Um, as you're entering into year two, you're now coming into a couple hundred patients. Um, and there's tasks, right, that have to happen in the office. Um, there's also um, benefit to someone being there, helping you be the face of the business or the practice. Um, Dr. Williams is also um, a uh, former webinar participant mm -hmm. um, down in Alabama, and um, you know he he quotes uh, um, locals like locals, <laughs> and I love it. Right, it's so true. Right, when you're your MA or your office manager is um, also a part of the community and they know half the community, well, geez, that helps a great deal, right? It's just connective tissue um, as to that network. Um, so the question about um, long-term though, and or um, going all the way on through into full panel, um, these businesses certainly tolerate a full-time equivalent, a full-time person on site. Um, without question, and then some, be honest with you. Um, and and uh, you can virtualize uh, those services as well. So, you know, we do offer um, virtual clinical staff, um, which is basically a service, not just a specific individual um, that makes, uh, allows for a reliable um, service level to be achieved. It's a great backstop for that one local person um, you know, people go on vacation, they're out sick or geez, every now and then things ebb and flow. All of a sudden you're busy, it's flu season and you're just got an inflow of people that want to see you. Um, every practice goes through that. And, uh, and then there are times when it's quieter. Uh, we like, we're in such an interesting time in the sense that, um, we're sort of in this gig economy that, um, enables you to kind of grab resources as you need them. And um, we would counsel to go ahead and do that, right? Utilize that, um, figure out ways to flex capacity as you need it. Um, and um, certainly, uh, like I said, the business case justifies um, these services, whether it's us or somebody else, hmm. but um, you know, the model will tolerate it. Okay, awesome. Um... So around that around that question or or that answer, Dave, people are asking me, how do they know they're successful? It's kind of a funny question. <laughs> <That's>, I, <laughs> and when they're ready for that, follow your heart, I guess. I don't know. You know, I mean, it's a you're gonna know, right? It's it's. I smile because there's there's, uh, and I'm probably smiling with, even if it, they're looking at this as a recording a week from now, um, there will be people that are past clients or people that are in this industry that have passed through that and the, yeah. they're probably smiling as well. It's just really obvious. You'll know yeah. it's it's really clear what life is like. And, um, you know, even patient behavior, um, it's not something we touched on before, but um, the moment you, ex you remove that scarcity yeah. element in, in the relationship, you know, when a when when you call into a 
hospital-based practice and you, um, they're, you're told they can see you in three weeks, you're like, huh? As opposed to in DPC, oh, I can see this afternoon or tomorrow morning. Um, all of a sudden, all that fear, uncertainty, and doubt just falls away. Suddenly your patients are like, hey, doc, have a great vacation. I'll catch you when you get back, right? There's just a bit more of a mutual trust and respect um, that's just healthy. So that's one of your indicators, by the way. So when you see that starting to happen, you'll know you're being successful. Yeah, I love that. I love I love hearing people's stories about patients being shocked when they're getting them directly or, uh, you know, when they go to, yeah, and they come to the good. practice and they, they, the doc or NP greets them at the door and they're like, Am, am I early? Like where? And they're like, no, nope, this is direct care. <laughs> so, that's how it works. so yeah, that's awesome. Uh, why don't we take this question here? We had a, a attendee put in, um, I'm happy in my current specialty practice, but I am interested in opening an integrative medicine practice. Very cool. And um, that doesn't require me uh, seeing the patients. I envision my position being more of supervision. So yeah. It sounds like you would maybe own the practice and employ a nurse practitioner or a um, physician in that situation. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, love this question. And we do have um, some clients uh, that are approaching that and doing that um, right now. Um, it, it, you know, it comes at the heart. Not everybody's going to have that interest. But um, if you see yourself as a CEO running an enterprise that has the ability to grow, um, wonderful. Think about how to scale yourself. Um, you know, you're you're um, probably thinking, "Geez, I could I could open up an integrative medicine practice, hire someone, and um, enjoy some of that return on invested capital, um, and maybe even keep doing it, doing another one." Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the business tolerates that as well. It's um, you know, just on basic family medicine. By the way. Uh, you know, the, um, I, I'm, I'm very comfortable telling you that you'll make more money than uh, you would in a, a traditional practice. But the more you branch out into the things that potentially help people's health, help them deal with stuff, um, weight management's a big one right now that's popping up um, and having ex incredible success at driving uh membership yeah. and and patients especially in that integrative world like especially you yeah. in that integrative world that's right so um it um it is uh you know obviously a very um doable thing um not everybody's gonna want to do that we we've got clients and just in relationships that we are aware of now today that um where the practice is incredibly successful, they've built an incredible brand in a community. And, you know, I call that an enabling asset. Once you have the relationship, that's an enabling asset that can be taken beyond. And that's maybe the key point there. But um, one here locally, um, she and I have known each other now for about six or seven years. Um, and we get together from time to time and, and frequently over the last five years anyway, since she's been full, um, she will... Um, she'll sort of hint at it, you know, I'm thinking about maybe another location or adding more, you know, another NP. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, she's done so well with her localized brand that um, when she did add the NP, um, she said, oh, I'm going to be able to take on, I'm going to take on another 100 patients. And um, so opened up enrollment and it was like in two weeks, it was full. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that that you know and so she, you could you could look at her and say go be your own ceo go ahead and open up a bunch of these right um and um that's not her interest so mm -hmm. you know so therefore we don't push right and uh you know she's home with her she wants to be with her children she wants to be have a family life she wants balance she's an active outdoors person mm -hmm. and um she's enjoying that right so that's what's right for her and that's what's right then mm -hmm. um and the same would be true then for this um integrative medicine practice um if there are any follow-on questions about that take me where you want to go um because uh, i think that's why some of the folks here today are here yeah i think um you're right on there i see a few few names here and they are on a similar path as you of wanting to be more of a owner and not as um, hands-on necessarily of practicing in the practice. Um, we just recently had a um, webinar two weeks ago with uh, two nurse practitioners from your corner pediatrics, Katie McGovern and Elizabeth Bowen. 
And um, they talked a lot about being an NP and owning, they actually own their business as well. Um, they have a collaborating physician that they work with, but we're seeing, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that we'll continue to see this change across the U.S. for um, what those requirements are. So there's quite a, quite a big interest right now, especially for MDs looking to own and um, employ NPs that would need um, that collaborating partner. Uh, one thing that we're always going to circle back to with that is looking at your local uh, laws uh, associated with that. Mm. Um, so if that's you thinking about that, please, what my uh, next suggestion would be to book a call with us where Dane and I could work with you one-on-one uh, -on -one and kind of look at what that would entail and uh, take a look at some of those numbers as well. Um, there was one more question, and then we've got another one here in the chat. Um, we've touched on opening the second practice. So actually, I think we can go ahead and hop on. We've got a question here from Dr. Walker, who I love. I love this with this marketing plug, uh, who's offering herself up to uh, Suzanne, who's in here asking about how to make referrals. So um, you've got a DPC open. Feel free to drop your information there and, and your location for her. Uh, nice job, Dr. Walker. <laughs> um, she's wanting to know, uh, does, do you know of any grants, Dean, that are available for doctors trying to get marketing going and helping with hiring other providers? Um, there are. Um, so it's mostly more localized. Um, I, I routinely read the articles <laughs> that that um, um, point at um, dollars that never get allocated, dollars that are set aside and never get allocated. I forget what the percentage is, even at a federal level, how many dollars for, um, you know, women-owned businesses um, or uh, community development or what have you. I know here in Hendricks County, for example, there's a, an organization that, uh, a nonprofit um, that places money into organizations, whether for profit or not for profit, um, that help this community. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not insignificant dollars. I mean, I think that one, I think they're placing about $10,000 at a time. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, uh, you just have to look a little more locally uh, for those. Um, chambers also are a great place to find out more about those. Um, usually, executive directors of chambers of commerce. Um, are keenly aware of what a community is doing to develop its um, community or its uh, its services to that community, whether it's physician services or senior services or what have you. They they uh, do make dollars available for those, and um, they're pretty reasonable in how they make it accessible. Um, banks, of course, will also do it. Um, there are SBA uh, programs as well. Um, which is nice if you qualify that um, is a little lower interest in, interest rates than you might get from some lenders. Um, it's a little more arduous of a process, but uh, um, some of them are doing a little better at making that a little more streamlined. But yes, um, I, 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 I apologize. I, I, I can't put my finger on it specifically for um, your geography, but um, I know in every community I live that, that that stuff exists and it's there. It's definitely sitting there. I, I um, like that you were asking about marketing to um, Dr. Walker with that. So um, I'll speak on that a little bit. Um, I think that one issue that we've seen and going back to our earlier conversation about things going wrong is um, people in direct care putting money into just a normal um, marketing firm saying, hey, you know, market me as a physician. Uh, market me as a nurse practitioner. And what often happens is that they're not familiar with the direct care model and they will just bucket you under healthcare, which as we've all we all know here in this group that it's not the same thing. Membership based and um not accepting insurance is a completely different world. That's that's how everything else is run in the traditional world. Um, so what when you're looking at your marketing, you're going to be looking more at marketing yourself as a small gym, marketing yourself as a Netflix, a membership based um, area. So when you're looking for hiring someone to get marketing going, you're going to want to be very specific with them about um, what that practice is. And I would even hesitate to probably work with someone who hasn't been in a membership-based area before. Um, shameless plug here, we have a uh, fabulous interactive uh, social media program uh, with Freedom that we've seen a, a lot of great success. Of course, um, social media is a little different than um, um, marketing as a whole, traditional marketing, yeah. <laughs> but um, that's one thing that's really cool about DPC is you know everything is so relationship focused and community focused that social media does really well. 
And for those of you who are trying to be um, really lean with your, your budget there and maybe do more on your own than uh, work with people, there's a lot that you can do and a lot of free resources out there to help um, get you set up in that arena. Um, in in May, uh, gosh, I can't even believe we're talking about May already. <laughs> um, but in race May, season, sorry. Yeah, Did I just... yeah, race it. We are in Indianapolis, so we have to mention <laughs> race season, of course. But um, uh, we do have a quite a few webinars coming in May. So a few surprises of some uh, uh, maybe DPC celebrities <laughs> in the marketing world coming too. But um, that will be going over marketing and what you can do for yourself too. Um, if you're you're not ready to maybe invest in that. Um, but one thing to note with marketing, as long as you have someone who's very familiar with DPC, that return on investment is, what is it, Dana? Chef's kiss? Is that the best way to compare? <laughs> it is, it's a, it, a great return. It, yeah, I, I I really meant that earlier um, when I said, I don't know if I've been in an I've come from tech hardware and logistics um, from my background. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know of an industry um, more correlated directly when you spend dollars in marketing, getting an outcome of, of members and getting a payback. Mm -hmm. So it's it's pretty tangible. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be different everywhere, every, you know, and for every circumstance. But um, uh, probabilistically, I would tell you it's a much higher probability of success than it is in many other industries. Yeah, so uh, definitely keep that in mind. And um, when you when we close, um, there will be an email coming out with this recording, and it'll also have a spot for you to uh, reserve your place for the future coming webinars. They're always free, great information coming there that will help um, point you in the right direction if you're also interested in, in marketing, especially. And then we have um, our CEO, Chris Habig, will be joining us at the um, end of the month as well for a webinar that will be great. Um, I'm looking at our chat here. Yeah, lots of good topics. That yeah. the grants, um, th that's interesting. That that's a thread we should pull on. We could do mm -hmm. a topic on that in the future. Yeah, I, I would. That would be great. That would mm -hmm. be a, a good one for sure. Certainly. Um, the other side of that question from Dr. Walker is help hiring other providers. Do you have any resources for that? Uh, meaning like expanding. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So. Um, we aren't a recruiter per se. Um, one of the things we do do or we're learning um, uh, is as a part of our Freedom Doc uh, brand proposition. Um, so I mentioned earlier under the Freedom Doc brand, we're um, leaning into some of the practices and helping them get started, giving them the available working capital. Um, part of that also has the promise on the back end that when you're ready to retire, um, that we would help you then find a replacement physician. And so we're kind of in the process of doing that right now with a localized practice. Um, and uh, we do we are uh, locally recruiting. So we know how to do it and we're able to do it. Um, we certainly understand what's the profile of the individual we're looking for. Um, we run them through a pretty rigorous um, vetting process. So we um, have them do a, an evaluation, a predictive index, we call it. Um, you know, there's a there's a vetting process that goes through, and then once that matches up with the provider, and there's um, then there's a plan around handoff of the practice over to the new provider. There's a buyout provision, so you have an exit um, with a financial benefit to you for having built that practice, um, and then uh, you know, and then you can go into retirement at, um, with it knowing your patients are in good hands. You've had a hand in in that conversion or that transition. Um, and there's been a constructive transition. Thank you. Okay, I think I think we have all of our questions answered. I will uh, go back through this chat after, and if I've missed one of your questions, I'll reach out to you uh, via email and make sure that that does get answered for you. Um, I think just the very last thing, Dana, is, is more about how to sustain the, the operation of the business once you're started, once you've got that robust patient panel, uh, you've got your other person hired on, maybe a, an NP or another physician, how do you sustain um, op the operations side? Right. So um, there's, you know, obviously in the business, this business is fairly easy to understand, right? And it's fairly much a cash business. So cash in, expenses out, end of month, you know how you did. It's pretty straightforward. So there's operations and um, administrative expenses. Much of the what you do in the sustaining operational expenses and the choices you make around those are how I would answer that. So um, if you're um, if you are comfortable 
um, outsourcing, there are lots of options. We we offer those as well. Um, we aren't the only game in town, but uh, you know we we work hard to enable you in every way we can. Um, we are in this gig society, which is um, amazing. You can um, contract uh, almost anything you need need when you want it and how you want it. Um, there are some drawbacks to that. Um, you know, sometimes you lose those people when you didn't want to lose them. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, um, you want to look at return on those, like, or the the cost benefit relationship um, and the flexibility that you gain um, in having those. Back to that question about um, the specialist investing in, in a, in a, a um, integrative medicine practice. Mm -hmm. um, we probably have a lot to offer there in that conversation. Um, but uh, the key there is how do you get scale um, and don't risk uh, or introduce additional risk? So um, that's a topic we could probably go on to in a whole webinar in and of itself. But um, uh, yeah, I think it's just key in recognizing um, and being very open to new things coming. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that uh, I would characterize, this is still a fairly new industry, Direct care happened a hundred years ago. It even happened clear up till about the eighty, early nineties, when this whole thing became what it is today. Um, and uh, so, I call this an industry that's fairly um, youthful. And um, what that means is, is there are a lot of industry participants that are showing up, a lot of market choices, and to have a process of your own where you're evaluating those choices and making sure that you're picking the best partners and that you're, um, oh, wow, geez, I can do something now with GPT chat, right? Um, or chat GPT, I said that backwards, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, um, I don't know where that applies in this, in, in medicine. I was just grabbing that because that's such a hot topic today. Yeah. <laughs> the point is, is that things like that are popping up all the time, as well as new vendors. There's um, And there's new features and integrations that are popping up in the, the uh, platforms that are continuing to develop that already are the constituents in the industry. So being evaluative of that, um, you know, networking and gaining insight from your peers and from folks that are in the industry, those answers tend to become fairly clear. Awesome. Okay. Well, um, I think we have answered all of the questions that we had submitted here and um, in the chat as well. Again, if, if um, any of you have other questions, please feel free to send them um, to that email or drop them below. If you'd like to take them offline, I'm happy to um, do that. I will hang around here for a few more minutes to um, take those questions as they come. Um, I just want to take a second to thank Dean for coming and putting up with all of my questions. <laughs> He's already used to getting many of them a day, so it uh, shouldn't be too too new there. Um, and thank all of you for attending. Uh, we we um, love hosting these and we'll keep doing it as long as you, you've got questions. Um, so please feel free to to hop in for um, the rest of the series here. And um, as far as kind of where to go next, that's everybody's question is what do I do next? Um, the next move for you would be to book a call. Uh, we can get one-on-one. -on -one. We've answered all of these uh, common questions today, but I'd love to be able to answer your specific questions to you and really um, customize how you can move forward and, and what that path will look, for, look like for you. Uh, as Dane mentioned earlier, anyone who is a, a friend of DPC is a friend of ours, and we would love to be um, a part of your journey there and help get you pointed in the right direction. So uh, thank you very much. Do you have anything you want to add? Nothing more. Just have a great weekend, and thanks right. for coming. Yeah, have a great weekend. We will see you soon.